Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the Autumn Rivulet section and we now meet a little poem called Thought. And of course, as poem number 20 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets, we've commented on autumn being that which is old, rivulets that which is new. Now this will be the fourth time in Leaves of Grass thus far that we've seen the word thought as a title. You'll maybe remember that we saw this three times in By the Roadside, and then two other times the word thoughts with the S at the end of it. One more time we're going to see thought in Whispers of Heavenly Death. Now our assumptions are that you've been with us from the very beginning at Learn strong.net down that left hand side talks with Walt our playlist and you've been with us from the inscriptions passages all the way up to obviously by the roadside and then into uh, autumn rivulets with a set of introductory comments that I'm hopeful that you have as well already had a moment with and then uh, of course we just uh, we just finished uh, a few moments ago <coughs> with uh, I was looking a long while now we turn to this poem Thought. Now, our Nortons will give us some background information here on this poem. It was first published as number three of the Thoughts group, and again, we commented on that earlier in, in Roadside, uh, it, of Leaves of Grass in 1860 and has remained unchanged under this title in all succeeding ed editions. And uh, by the way, um, when, we, when we meet a little bit in, uh, at the very end of this uh, uh, of, at the end of this poem, we're going to talk about this French word and its meaning sleepwalkers as we get into this. Now, this poem is a fascinating little poem, and I want to take you back just for a moment to the poems, the three poems of, of Roadside with Thought. You'll remember the first one, Thought number one, Thought number two, not Thought number three is, is the way we can think about it. In Thought number one, it was of obedience, faith, adhesiveness, as I stand aloof and look there is, to me, something profoundly affecting in large masses of men following the lead of those who do not believe in men. Notice the use of the word of. And then in the, the second of these three, of justice, as if justice could be anything but the same ample law expounded by natural judges and saviors, as if it might be this thing or that thing according to decisions. And then finally, thought number three, of equality, as if it harmed me, giving others the same chances and rights as myself, as if it were not indispensable to my own rights that others possess the same. Now, for reasons that we'll have to get into, here thought, not in the roadside, but now in the autumn rivulets section, of persons, so you'll see this, of construction, of persons arrived at high positions, ceremonies, wealth, scholarships, and the like. To me, all that those persons have arrived at sinks away from them, except as it results to their bodies and souls. So that often, to me, they appear gaunt and naked, and often, to me, each one mocks the others and mocks himself or herself, and of each one, the core of life, namely happiness, is full of the rotten excrement of maggots. And often, to me, those men and women pass unwittingly the true realities of life and go toward false realities. And often, to me, they are alive after what custom has served them, but nothing more. And often, to me, they are sad, hasty, unwaked, sonambulas walking the dusk. And again, this um, sonambulas uh, French here, the, the sleepwalkers, in other words. Well, this is a powerful uh, little poem that I think we're going to have to now jump into to try to figure out exactly what is it that he's saying here. Notice he'll begin with this notion of persons. And we've seen this in Lisa Grass, the other, the, the, the ones not completely understood, those who stand behind the mask from Song of, uh, Song of the Open Road, of persons arrived at, notice it's high positions, as opposed to the average man that we were just commenting on in, I was looking a long while. Ceremonies, he always comments on wealth, that, that whole social thing. Scholarships, of course, the academics and all of that. And the like, right? A, a very American phrase, and the like. In other words, when I think about all these people that have all this position and power and class, academic, uh, you know, accomplishments, he says in parenthetics, to me, all that those people have arrived at 
sinks away from them. You'll remember this use of the word sinks. It's the only other time it gets used in Salud Amal number two. Slinks away from them, except as it results to their bodies and souls. Go back to what he said in Song of Myself, passage 48. I've said that the soul is not more than the body, and body is not more than the soul, and nothing that God is greater to one than oneself is. Notice here, it's bodies and souls. So that, and then we're going to get five oftens, right? And that formulation is fascinating to me. So that often to me, these people appear gaunt and naked. Um, uh, you'll, you'll remember this uh, gaunt from Song of Myself 15 and as I sit and look out. And of course, naked is a very popular word in Leaves of Grass and now used at least already 15 times uh, um, in Leaves of Grass up to this point. And he says, often to me, each one mocks the other. You'll remember this use of the word mocks from Song of the Open Road number six and mocks himself or herself. And of each one, the core of life. By the way, that phrase only used one time in Leaves of Grass, and it's right here. The core of life, namely happiness. Remember his use of happiness in Song of Myself 25, and then obviously Song of Myself 50, when he said it, it is happiness, is full, and then this is one of the most amazing lines in all Leaves of Grass, full of the rotten excrement of maggots. Excrement gets used one time in all these of grass, and it's right here. Maggots, you'll maybe remember in by Blue Ontario Shore, number seven, to the dung hill maggots. So he's coming back to some of these powerful images. Uh, Blue Ontario is a fascinating poem to read alongside this. We'll, we'll uh, explain it here in a moment some more. And often to me, those men and women pass unwittingly, and, I, and, and again, it's, it's not conscious that, that uh, he, he's going to point it, it's not conscious that they live um, um, half-lived lives. The true realities of life, this sounds a whole lot, of course, like Thoreau's, um, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. We talked about that in, in its entirety in all of Walden, at least, at uh, learnstrong.net, and go towards false realities, only time in all of Leaves of Grass that phrase, false realities, gets used and it's right here. And, and, but this sounds so much like Idolans that if you go back and study the inscriptions poem Idolans, you're going to hear some of this. And often to me, they are alive after what custom has served them, but nothing more. In other words, what is it that the great uh, Dr. Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. said? Oh, there are so many people who are dead, we're just waiting for them to stop breathing to prove what we've known about them for so long. Here, Whitman is playing the same kind of game. In other words, they're alive, but only after a custom. There's something missing in their lives. And often to me they are, and then he'll say it, sad. It's interesting, hasty. Go back and run that to ground the way he uses that word. Unwaked. Uh, taking us again back to by Blue Ontario Shores, passage 19, when he used that phrase. And that makes us think about, of course, the Thoreau passage from Walden. We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn that does not forsake us in our sound asleep, he'll say. And then, again, this French word, uh, which will mean sleepwalkers, walking the dusk. And we'll see this when we meet this poem, Sleepers, which is, many argue, one of the most amazing poems at all of Leaves of Grass. Well, what is it that he's saying in a poem like this? Well, I think the point that he's making at 2A is that sometimes that the most learned, the most educated, the most popular are actually the most unhappy because life is about so much more than knowledge. Life, you'll remember, is about wisdom. And of course, Song of the Open Road, Passage 6 takes us back to it. Wisdom can't be taught in schools it, it's something that's far more important than something to be learned, right? At 2B, I love the word choice here, the rotten excrement of maggots. This seems to me to be a line that can only be created by a poetic genius when he talks about how dull the existence is of so many people who live their lives only half lived. At 3A, well, the fact that we were talking and messing around with the rotten excrement of maggots makes us think about Hamlet and of course in uh, Act 4 scene 1 when the king asks where is Polonius's body oh he's at supper not where he eats but where he is eaten a certain convocation of politic worms eat at him even now um, you can go to find our comments on Hamlet at learnstrong.net in detail I, I love the other thought poems and the way that they compare with this poem. That's a fun study. I like to think of the biblical passage from Ecclesiastes and the way in which 
there, we're, we're playing a very similar game. I think there is much of Ecclesiastes in Leaves of Grass, and especially, especially in this poem. But I want to, for a moment, take you to T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets and to Little Getting too. And I, I have said to you guys a number of times, I don't think you can read T.S. Eliot without having a real good study of Leaves of Grass. And I think that Eliot owed El, uh, uh, Eliot owed Whitman far more than he ever was willing to admit. For example, do you remember this passage? We commented on this in its entirety at Learn Strong God, not all of the four poems of four quartets. In the uncertain hour, this is again a um, little getting to, in the uncertain hour before the morning, near the ending of interminable night at the reoccurring end of the unending, after the dark dove with a flickering tongue had passed below the horizon of his only, while the dead leaves still rattled on like tin over the asphalt where no other sound was, between three districts, Whence the smoke arose. I met one walking, loitering and hurried as if blown towards me like the meadow leaves before the urban dawn wind unresisting. And as I fixed upon the downturned face that pointed scrutiny with which we challenged the first met stranger in the waning dusk. By the way, just go to the last line of this poem. The waning dusk. I caught the sudden look of some dead master whom I had known, forgotten, half recalled, both one and many. And the brown baked features, the eyes of a familiar compound ghost, both intimate and unidentifiable. Um, now, I, I, I will just pause for a moment to point out that, of course, scholars have been debating, as I say in my lectures on these lines. Uh, and some have seen it as Dante, some have seen it as Yeats. I've never read that anybody wanted to argue that it was Whitman. And yet, when I read a poem like this, I'm ready to make connections uh, did you notice how many times the word leaves gets used there? And then, of course, this use of this idea of dusk. To just go back one more time to the last lines here. And often to me, they're sad, hasty, unwaked, sonambles, walking the dusk. I find that a compelling way to look back at little getting, and especially little getting to. Finally, in 3B, what is, in your estimation, the true source of real happiness in your life? Um, when you look at this line, the rotten excrement of maggots, is it possible that your life has often been lived at that level? And is it possible that a study of leaves of grass is bringing you to some other type of sense of happiness? I hope so. Thank you.